We are in 2 Kings, and we are in session 3. We'll do session 3 and 4 tonight, two sessions back to back. And uh, we'll be dealing with chapters 8 through 10 in this session. Just to give you the perspective again by way of review, we're dealing with two kingdoms, the, the kingdom divided after Solomon between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And uh, 1 Kings, covers, we covered it up through, well, where it shows on the chart there. And uh, the northern kingdom goes from bad to worse. All bad kings, going, they get worse and worse until they finally get wiped out as God's judgment on them. That's over a period of about uh, over two centuries. And then God washes his hands of it. He went into the Assyrian captivity. The southern kingdom went from bad to worse, but did have uh, about seven or eight good kings and uh, covers about three, an extra century out of all that. But in 606, they go into captivity, but to, to return because of God's, not because they deserved it, but because of God's commitment to the house of David. And that will echo all through these books as we explore the history of these two kingdoms, sometimes fighting, sometimes in alliance. Tonight we are in the, in, a, in the region just a little below from where we were last time, but in the early part, obviously, of the book from, in the, from Jeroboam through Athaliah the, in the house of Judah, the southern kingdom in uh, Joram and uh, Jehu in the northern kingdom. We're going to go to Athaliah. How many of you knew that the house of Judah had a queen for a while? For six years, can you imagine? That comes as a shock to many Bible students to realize there was actually a queen on the throne of David for a short while, a usurper. We'll talk about that as we get into it. But be on your alert. There's two kings, and they're almost, almost they, uh, they overlap a little bit. Jerome, so, uh, some Bibles will, uh, Jehoram and Je Jerome, um, are both the same transliteration of the Hebrew. And some Bibles will transliterate them differently to keep you from getting confused. And uh, we have not tried to do that too much, at least probably a little inconsistently, primarily so you'd be alert to who, whether you're talking about the northern or southern kingdom, with, and you get that from the context. But they're two different people, not, no relation, obviously. And also, there is Ahaziah. And uh, we encountered him at the end of First Kings in the northern kingdom, we're going to discover that Jehoram Jer Jer has a uh, son by the name of Ahaziah that will be, that'll be prominent in uh, tonight's session. There's also Ahab and Jezebel not only had sons, they had a daughter. And this daughter is Athaliah, and we're going to talk about her. Uh, she ends up marrying, um, uh, and, and, and by doing so, uh, intrudes herself as a usurper in the lines of Judah. We'll talk about that. And uh, so we're in 2 Kings chapter 8, and uh, let's just jump in. Then spake Elisha. Now we're, uh, but by the way, this first episode that opens uh, chapter 8 really deals with God's marvelous care for those who trust Him, even in times where apostasy is popular. We're dealing with very, very um, spiritually dark times, especially in the northern kingdom. And uh, God does one thing after another to try to get their attention to no avail. But still, it's instructive. And as we watch God's extremes here, let's be sensitive to how it might apply to us for lots of reasons. Anyway, then spake Elisha unto the woman whose son he had restored to life. Remember from last time. Saying, Arise and go thou and thine household and sojourn wherever thou canst sojourn. For the Lord hath called for a famine, and it shall also come upon the land seven years. God is sending a famine to the northern kingdom to get their attention because of their apostasy. But through Elisha, this woman is tipped off to, to anticipate that. And uh, so he, he uh, directs her to leave the country temporarily for a seven-year period. And this is really intended to be punishment for apostasy. And you'll find in the, in the Torah, Deuteronomy 11 and 28, a number of places that kind of thing uh, highlighted. Verse 2, and the woman rose and did after the saying of the man of God. And she went with her household and so sojourned in the land of the Philistines seven years. So very interesting how often this happens. You may recall the study of Ruth where Naomi does the same thing. Bitter famine in Bethlehem, she goes to Moab in that case to sojourn for 10 years actually. But in any case, here she is, this woman that Elisha has... Uh, uh, been taken care of, uh, and uh, she's trusting the word of the man of God. So she left her home and, and for seven years. Okay, verse 3. And it came to pass at the seven years' end 
that the woman returned out of the land of the Philistines, she went forth to cry unto the king for her house and for her land. And so she's trying to get her property back. She's abandoned this property for seven years. And uh, someone obviously has taken it over in her absence. And she's, she's not asking, by the way, for it to be returned to her free. She's willing to buy it back, since apparently it was a paternal inheritance to her. And, uh, and that was guaranteed to every Israelite family by the law of Moses. Now, we, we need to be careful here. I won't make a big thing of it here because it's not essential to the study. But be sensitive to the fact that when they talk about buying and selling land, they're not talking about the way we do it in Fee Simple. We're used to selling the title, and we can pass that on to our heirs, etc., or whoever wants to buy it. Not in Israel. What they really bought and sold was the use of the land, because at various at certain periods it would return to its original owners, was the concept under the Jubilee and the sabbatical years and so forth. So recognize that we're talking about usage. In any case here, though, uh, the intent was that the land would stay with the families that it was originally ascribed to, and they might sell the use of it to pay some debts, but it, it, there were procedures by which it would return to them. So she's go, she went to the king, to, she went forth to the king to, to try to get her land back. In verse 4, it says, The king talked with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me, I pray thee, all the great things that Elisha hath done. Now, the fact that Gehazi is here tells you that this episode that is here chronicled isn't necessarily in chronological order. Because we remember from, from the, when, when Naaman the Syrian was there that Gehazi... In, in, from his greed, ended up getting name as leprosy. So Gehazi's out of the picture chronologically from that day on, to the best of my understanding. I think this is a flashback. It's an episode that occurred earlier, and inserted here by the writer to highlight uh, uh, an issue that will be relevant to uh, the story going on. But uh, anyway, we, we see um, Jehoram um, talking to Gehazi, Elisha's servant. He, he's I think he's motivated more by curiosity than compassion to begin with. He tell me more all the great things that Elisha has done. It came to pass as he was telling the king how he had restored a dead body to life. You remember that with Elisha? That behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life cried to the king for her house and for her land. Very startling that she actually must be available to interrupt. That's the impression you get here. And Gehazi said, My lord, O king, this is the woman and this is her son whom Elisha restored life. So you get the impression somehow that while Gehazi is having this conversation with the king, that she somehow is able to bust in and, and speak for herself, and, and Elisha makes the uh, identity here, and, uh, uh, and on it goes. And so um, now her appearance apparently impresses Jehoram so, so um, uh, much that he asks her to fill in the details of Gehazi's story. So he'll even order, not only that the land goes back to her, but the proceeds from the sale of the land will also be given to hers. When the king asked the woman, he told him, and the king appointed unto her a certain officer, saying, Restore all that was hers and all the fruits of the field since the day that she left the land, even until now. So the king has uh, gone all the way from just curiosity to the point where he really establishes her. Part of this, the speculation of most commentators, the, the writer put this in here to demonstrate how God provides uh, for, the, for the faithful. The Shunammite woman um, was a believer. He removed her from the famine during those seven years and then also brings her here and, and blesses her upon her return. It's remarkable also, to read so you don't miss this either, is that she is faithful to the worship of the Lord. The king is not. He's an idolater. He's the northern kingdom. So it's very remarkable that he, on the one hand, blesses her, even though her belief system and her commitment and her loyalty is not to the God that he really worships. Rather rather interesting. And so, uh, anyway, moving on, verse 7. And Elisha came to Damascus. And uh, we're now going to talk about uh, how uh, some intrigues with the Aram, the, 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 the people that we would think of as Syrians up there. Elisha came to Damascus, and Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, was sick, and was told him, saying, the man of God has come here. This is kind of interesting that Elisha will go that far, out of the land, up to Damascus. It's not that far in miles, but it's, it's out of the country. It's, it's, in, in, it's in Syria. He goes there uh, to, to uh, you know, uh, uh, see him, and... Uh, the, uh, this is unusual, obviously. Um, and the king said to Hazael, that's one of his, his uh, uh, officials, take a present in thine hand and go and meet the man of God and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, shall I recover this disease? Here is a pagan king, king of Syria, 
telling his servant to go see Elisha and find out from the Lord whether he's going to survive or not. That's pretty interesting. It's too bad that the leadership in the northern kingdom didn't do the same thing, is go to the Lord for their instruction rather than their idols and their whatever. So anyway, verse 9, So Hazael went to meet him and took a present with him, even of every good thing of Damascus, forty camels burden. And came and stood before him and said, Thy son Ben-Hadad of king of Syria hath sent me to thee, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? Now this, this is pretty impressive, forty camels. Now don't get the impression they're fully loaded, by the way. I understand that the experts say that what they would often do is put one gift per camel. So it, it, part of it is, is, is a question of making a show. But still, you're talking a caravan of 40 camels um, as, a, as a gesture of the king to Elisha for responding to an inquiry here, which, uh, <laughs> which is pretty impressive. And Elisha said unto him, Go, say unto him, Thou mayest certainly recover. Now he's, understand, Elisha is talking to Hazael, the servant of the king. Elisha said unto him, Go, say unto him, that thou mayest certainly recover. Howbeit, the Lord hath showed me that he shall surely die. That sounds like double speak, doesn't it? And he settled his countenance steadfastly until he was ashamed, and the man of God wept. Uh, let's see if I can sort this out a little bit, because it's, it's, it's from the text, a little hard to understand. What, what Elisha is trying to say to Haziel, that he would recover if Haziel won't interfere. But what Elisha is doing is indicating that in the state of his disease, he will recover. But he's also prophesying that Haziel is going to murder him. And Haziel realizes that as he looks, as, as, as Elisha looks him right in the eye. And as Elisha realizes that uh, Ben-Hadad, who is apparently a friend of his, he's, he feels about because the man of God wept as a result of this, because he knew that murder was going to come upon his friend. Elisha fixes a gaze upon him in the hopes, perhaps, of embarrassing him out of that deed. But privately, Haziel is probably glad because uh, of, of Ben-Hadad's fate, because, he, uh, because uh, he, he, he will be able to stand in, to pick up the throne. And uh, so God's revelation also gives the man of God uh, uh, insight that he weeps. You know, it's a, how often that is, we often think of, gee, to be a prophet and know what's coming would be exciting. But you'll notice if you study your scripture, how often it's the prophet that sees the future that weeps. The best example of that, of course, is Jeremiah, who's known as the weeping prophet. Not only because, because his prophecies, he, he really, in a sense, presided over his dying nation before the Babylonian captivity. Uh, you remember um, John, Revelation, in chapter 10, when, the, when the, uh, he's told to take the book and it would be sweet in his mouth, but it, to his belly it would be bitter. And how off that is, it's, it's, it's good at first until you really realize the, the penalty of sin and the penalty of, ju penalty of judgments that are coming and so forth. So that's a very typical thing. Anyway, let's move on to verse, verse 12. And Hazael said, Why weepeth, my Lord? And he answered, that's Elisha answered, Because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds wilt thou set on fire, and their young men wilt thou slay with the sword, and will dash their children, and rip up their women with child. And Hazael said, But what, is thy servant a dog, that he should do this great thing? And Elisha answered, The Lord hath shown me that thou shalt be king over Syria. So, so uh, Hazael's getting a, getting, getting a lot, of, uh, lot of stuff here because at the first time, see in, in verse 13, Hazael pretends to be offended by this disclosure. He feigns the humility, am I a dog that I do that and so forth. But also before it's over here, uh, Elisha actually adds a prophecy that Hazael will be king over Syria. And uh, so moving on to verse 14. So he departed from Elisha and came to his master, who said to him, What said Elisha to thee? And he answered, He told me that thou shouldest surely recover. Which is sort of true, and yet it ain't true. Huh? It came to pass on the morrow, they took a thick cloth, dipped it in water, and spread it on his face so that he died. In other words, he suffocated him. And Hazael reigned in his stead. So he suffocated him in a way, apparently, that would create the impression. See, he, you know, it's really tragic. Elisha had predicted that he would be king. If he would have been smart, he would have waited for it to happen. 
That's what David did relative to Saul. He wouldn't touch Saul. He waited till God's timing. Hazael could have rested on that prophecy. But no, he took matters in his own hand. And he murdered the king. I might mention, by the way, back in 1 Kings 19, you may recall that Elijah, the predecessor of Elisha, had previously anointed Hazael as king. It didn't hit us then because we didn't have all the background. But um, so the, uh, this event that is here reported is in effect a fulfillment of that prophecy, even though it was done by Elisha, Elijah's uh, protege rather than Elijah personally. And now you say, gee, why would God have Haziel, um, this cruel guy, uh, 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 be, in, be in a situation to dominate Israel? See, be, they're going to be very, the Syrians are going to be very, very powerful. And this is part of God's discipline for his people. It's very, very disturbing, and it's yet very, very insightful to recognize as we go through here, God cares especially for his own people. And here are his own people that are disobedient. He goes through all these elaborate things to try to get their attention, to judge them. His focus is on his people. Uh, he is not ignoring the others, because we see him take care of the Shunammite woman. He took care of Naaman. But the focus is on the people that he's called. And that's disturbing, because if he's called us, then his focus is on us. And he expects more of us than he might of others, to whom much is given, much is required. But anyway, uh, let's move on to verse 16. In the fifth year of Jerom, the son of Ahab, in other words, this is a northern kingdom guy, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Jehoshaphat being then king of Judah in the south, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, began to reign. Now, um, 32 years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. Now Je Jehoshaphat appointed his son Jehoram as co-regent the year he went off to battle with Ahab at Ramoth Gilead. Uh, and uh, he probably thought he was going to be out of the country for a long time, but in any case, uh, Jehoram evidently remained in Jerusalem to run the country while his dad was gone. In the 18th year of Jehoshaphat's role, uh, sole reign in Judah was when Ahab's son Je Jehoram, that's in the northern kingdom, began to rule in Israel. It was the second year of Jehoram's co-regency with Jehoshaphat, so there's some overlap, but anyway... And by the way, I'll to tell you right up front, if you start trying to spend a lot of attention on the chronology and reconcile this, it's a very ambitious task because they keep records differently, north and south, and they don't do it consistently. In the north and in the south, at different times, they change the methods. So there are libraries full of experts who have tried to sort out what they call the chronology of the kings. The difference in rendering isn't great. A few years here and a few years there. It's not like there's some profound issue behind here, but just understand that it's a non-trivial task to try to really pay attention to this. And I have adopted, I uh, pretty much follow uh, the uh, Bible uh, knowledge uh, commentary as an example because it's very detailed and just to pick one rather than, I'm not, I, I have not tried to litter our notes with examples where they differ and stuff because it doesn't amount to a lot. Just be sensitive. If you're going to get into it, you can't get into that subject a little bit. Either really get into it or pass. You know, it's one of those things. You follow me. But... Uh, in any case, uh, let's go on to verse 18. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, as did the house of Ahab. That's bad news. In other words, uh, Ahab was one of the worst of the bunch up to that time. And um, he, is, he is doing the same thing. He walked in the way of the kings of Israel, as did the house of Ahab. For the daughter of Ahab was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, this is... when it says, See, understand who we're talking about here. We're talking about Jehoram the son of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. We're talking about a king of the southern kingdom who marries the daughter of Jezebel. Okay. And he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. See, if he was a king of Israel in the northern kingdom, that's one thing, but he's not. He's the south. He, he, he's following the, the, the pattern, the cultural uh, culture of Ahab. For the daughter of Ahab, Ahab and Jezebel, you might add, was his wife. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for David his servant's sake, as he promised him to give him all the way a light and to his children. So, in other words, this king is bad news. He married Athaliah, the daughter of Jezebel and Ahab. That's bad news right there. We're going to talk a lot about her in a little bit, so uh, we'll get into that more in more detail. But um, even though he's at bad news, God is gracious to the southern kingdom because of his promise to David. And that's going to echo all through here, that uh, 
his commitment to David. Because it'll, it pleases God to, to, to do that. If for no other reason, then his whole program of redemption is, is organized through the line of David, to the ultimate son of David, namely Jesus Christ. Anyway, verse 20, in his days, Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah and made a king over themselves. Now, by the way, just before I leave uh, Jehoram here, he was one of Judah's evil kings. In the, in the southern kingdom, there's some good guys, some bad guys. This is one of the bad guys. It's interesting, by the way, something else about him. Second Kings here mentions only two of the unfortunate events that marked the reign of Jehoram. One of them that's not included in your text, but you need to be aware of to follow what's going to come on later. Uh, he murdered six of his brothers. And most commentators take for granted that the one that talked, his wife is the one that talked him into it for some reasons that'll come, come forward later. Yeah, and uh, so, because no other Judean king practiced such a thing. But Athalia herself did the same thing when she later rules. And we'll talk about that in the next session in more detail. But, uh, okay, now, now get in, in verse 20 here, where the, the days of Edom revolted. You see, Edom had come under control of Judah under Jehoshaphat. And uh, he defeated a, a coalition of kingdoms that included Edom. Back, this is in Second Chronicles 20, if you want to look it up. At that time, an Edomite deputy may have been put in charge on the throne uh, in place of an Edomite king because they're in subject, subjection to Judah. And uh, Edom, helped, Edom helped Israel and Judah in their campaign against King Mesha, you may recall, in chapter 3 of 2 Kings before in the previous session. But now in Jehoram's day, Edom finally rebels and set up their king. That's the, in, in, say they not only revolted, but they made a king for themselves. So they, they, they threw off the provisional government, if you will. So Jehoram went over Zaire, and that might be, a, by the way, a translation of Seir, which is another idiom before Edom, Mount Seir. Anyway, and all the chariots with him. And he rose by night and smote the Edomites, which compassed him about, and the captains of the chariots and the people fled unto their tents. And yet Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah unto this day. Then Libna revolted at the same time. Now Libna was located southwest of Jerusalem near the border of Philistia. Uh, the uh, rebellion seems to have been precipitated by Philistine influence. We get that from 2 Chronicles, not 2 Kings. There's a lot of parallel passages here. And we're not going to try to reconcile all. We'll just pick what we need to, to follow the thread. So the, see, the Philistines invaded Judah in Jehoram's day. And of course, Judah suffered a lot of, uh, I mean, yeah, Judah suffered a lot of losses at their hands. And the Arabians also rebelled. Both Philistia and Arabia uh, feared and paid tribute to uh, uh, Jehoram's father. But uh, Judah's weaker under Jehoram, partly because of his wickedness. So his father had set these things up, but with this, the young guy taking over, they're taking the opportunity to throw him off because he doesn't have the strength. So he's not, first of all, he's not faithful. That's one of the, one of the reasons the nation is weak is because he's, he's, he's in apostasy. There's a lesson there. Anyway, the rest of the acts of Jehoram and all that he did are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. And Jehoram slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Ahaziah, his son, reigned in his stead. And this guy is going to be bad news. In the twelfth year of Jehoram, son of Ahab, king of Israel, did Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, begin to reign. So there's a Jehoram, son of Ahab, in the northern kingdom. And there's Jehoram, the son of uh, 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 Ahaziah. Uh, excuse me, Ahaziah, the son of Joram, in the south. Now, some Bibles will spell them differently to keep you getting confused. I elected not to do that because I think it's important be, to be tuned to it so you discern it by context. You with me? Here's a case where they don't have the same name. They're cotemporaneous, which makes it a little more complicated. But it, the text will usually tell you whether from the context or explicitly which one they're talking about. Two and twenty years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. And he reigned one year in Jerusalem, and here's the sentence. And his mother's name was Athalia. I think that's the way you pronounce it. Athaliah, anyway. Uh, the daughter of Omri, the king of Israel. Let's be a little more clear. Omri was the father of Ahab, and Ahab married Jezebel. So Athel uh, the way to remember Athaliah is she is the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. And the says that not only because she literally was, but she also was in spirit. She is a mean there's a term for that, but I shouldn't use it in polite company. <laughs> I'll let you draw your own conclusions from the text. Anyway, getting back to uh, Ahaziah. He walked, in the, he walked in the way of the house of Ahab. 
Now that's an indictment. He's in the south. He's part of Judah, not Israel, yet he's following the pattern of the idol-worshiping, idolaters, apostate, uh, uh, Baal worshippers in the north. And did evil in the sight of the Lord as did the house of Ahab, for he was the son-in-law of the house of Ahab. You got the picture, gang? You'll need to understand that as we go here. And he went with Jehoram, the son of Ahab, to war against Hazael, the king of Assyria, in Ramoth-Gilead. And the Syrians wounded Jehoram. Now, it may surprise you that they're an alliance. And by the way, another, another caution here. Don't confuse Ahaziah of Israel uh, and Ahaziah of Judah, the two different kings. Okay, Each ruled one year, and the reigns did not coincide. Ahaziah Judah reigned in the last year of Jehoram, the king of Israel. His reign commenced while he was 22 years old, uh, when his father Jehoram died of, of, of a sickness, by the way, intestinal problems. Now, Israel and Judah here are, are allies, which may be surprising. It's not, uh, they're still uh, allied here. And uh, this is why he joined his uncle Jehoram in battle against Haziel, the king of Aram, at Ramoth Gilead. And by the way, this is not the battle at Ramoth Gilead, which Ahab was fatally wounded. That's, that was, uh, uh, took place uh, 12 years earlier. Okay? Uh, there's a lot of, obviously, a lot of continual contests between Syria and the northern kingdom, and just as there are contests between Edom and the southern kingdom and so forth all the way through. So don't get them confused. There's, um, it takes some study to sort them through. But, uh, but the main point here that's making is Jehoram was wounded in this battle and returned to Jezreel. That's the plain of Jezreel where... Uh, you know, uh, at, the, at the foot of uh, Mount Megiddo, the, play, the, the seat of Armageddon, if you will. This is probably where Jehoram had his winter palace, by the way. He went there to recover from his injuries when he was wounded in battle. And Ahaziah went down from Jerusalem then to visit there. And uh, by the way, something that uh, we'll find out in the next chapter, but should may be useful to know here, is that while he was there, Jehu attacked and killed Jehoram, and, his, and Ahaziah fled to Megiddo. And we'll talk more about that in the next in, in chapter nine. So let's go to chapter nine. And we're going to hear now. We're going to see the rise of Jehu. Jehu is a strange contradiction. This guy, this uh, coming few chapters should be rated R at least. Um, uh, and yet, I mean, he's a rough guy, bloodthirsty, uh, decisive uh, guy on the one hand, but he ends up being a weak ruler. So a strange contradiction. I'll let you sort that out as you get to know him a little bit. But anyway, uh, chapter 9, verse 1. I might warn you that, see, Elijah uh, and Elisha were God's instruments to warn Ahab and, and, and all his relatives of consequences of apostasy. Jehu will turn out to be God's instrument of judgment when those kings in the north fail to repent. So Jehu, as blood, bloody as is, is God's instrument in this, so recognize that. Now, you may recall from first, back in 1 Kings 19 that uh, Elijah had been commissioned by God to anoint Jehu king over Israel. Uh, now, this assignment actually fell to his successor, Elisha, who delegated to one of his young prophets under his tutelage. And uh, so let's get into this. Verse 1, Elisha the prophet called one of the children of the prophets and said unto him, Gird up thy loins and take this box of oil in thine hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. Now, you gird up your loins. In other words, you, you take your flowing things and tuck it so you can run. It's the idea of traveling fast. He's going to tell him to run an errand, and when you run the errand, you get out of there. You know, I want you to be sensitive to that. He gives him some interesting instruction. And also gives him this flask of oil to use to anoint him when he, while Jehu was still in Ramoth Gilead. On the east, he's on the east side of the Jordan, in other words, uh, after the battles that were there and so on. Okay, verse 2. And when thou comest thither, look out there. Not look up, in other words. Look for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. And go in and make him rise up from among his brethren, carry him to an inner chamber. Now, Jehu is the commander of the army. That's Jehoram's army, the king of, of the northern king. And uh, his anointing is supposed to be done privately. By the way, don't get confused. Jehu is the son of Jehoshaphat. That's, not, that's a different Jehoshaphat that used to be king of the Judah. It's Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. It's a different guy. There happens to be two Jehoshaphats. Just recognize we've got north and south. The names are often common. But the Jehoshaphat, this, this relatively good king in the south, has got nothing to do with... Jehu is the son of a, a Jehoshaphat, a different Jehoshaphat. Are you with me? Are you together? And go and make him arise up from among his brethren and carry him to an inner chamber. In other words, find a private place to do all this. Then take the box of oil and pour it in on his head and say, Thus saith the Lord, key words, I have anointed thee king over Israel. 
then open the door and flee and tarry not. In other words, go in, uh, prophesy over this guy, anoint him king, and then get out of there. And uh, why would he do that? Well, because uh, what, uh, what the prophet is going to anoint Jehu um, for the God that, for the purpose that God had given him, which is to wipe out the entire Ahab dynasty. He's going not only to, he's going after all of them, and he will before he's through. And uh, so the trouble with these kinds of things, though, is often innocent people that are bystanders and get hurt. So Elisha wants him out of there, get at a good safe distance, because there's going to be a lot of echoes here. He's, so God's going to thoroughly annihilate Ahab's line, just as Elijah had prophesied back in 1 Kings 21. You may recall that Elijah had prophesied. Remember Mount Carmel and all that? He prophesied they're going to get all wiped out. Well, they're about to be. And Jezebel is also going to die exactly like Elijah foretold in 1 Kings 21. A good background review would be to read 1 Kings 21 uh, in anticipation of all this. But anyway, uh, so both Jer Jeroboam's dynasty and Baasha's dynasty had ended violently back in 1 Kings 15 and 16, and so would Ahab's. So let's move on. Let's see. Let's see. Where am I here? Um, so he arose and went to the house, and he poured oil on his head and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over all the people of the Lord, even over Israel. And thou shalt smite the house of Ahab thy master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. So that's, that's, the, that's the mission that Jehu attacks aggressively. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. I apologize for the language, but that's what it says. And what it means is the men. This is a way of saying the male line, the line that carries the legal titles. <laughs> so it's a rather colorful way of expressing it. I forgot to check what some of the modern translations do with that. They may try to hide the Hebrew because it's probably offensive to some people, but it's pretty graphic, pretty earthy, pretty straightforward. Anyway, uh, and, and continues, he says, I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah. And the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. Remember that thing, because we're going to come in the next session, some background there. And then what did the prophet do after delivering his message? <laughs> he opened the door and he split. <laughs> he got out of there. Okay, verse 10. Then Jehu came forth to the servants of his Lord. See, this is all done in private. So he comes out and the servants are curious. What's, what's, what's all going on here? And what said to him, is all well? Wherefore came this mad fellow to thee? <laughs> so they recognized him as a prophet. They called him a madman. By the way, that same word is used of Jehu's driving. You're going to discover that Jehu's characteristic is that he is a California driver. Okay. With his chariots and things. But anyway... And he said unto them, Ye know the man and his communication. See, Jehu is trying to dismiss this. He doesn't want to get into it with these guys. But they won't let go. They said, It is false. Tell us now. He said, Thus and thus spake to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over all Israel. So reluctantly, Jehu admits to him what this young prophet had, had uh, anointed him for. And what they immediately do, Hey, that's a great idea. They hasted, took every man his garment, and put it under him. Uh, on the top of the stairs, and they blew the trumpet saying, Jehu is king. It's a little premature, by the way. They've got a king. It's, that's going to have to be dealt with. But as far as they're concerned, they got their man here. So Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshi, the son of Nimshi, so don't confuse him with the Jehoshaphat of the second kingdom, which is earlier. Uh, the, the, so the Jehu conspired against Joram, Jehoram. Now Joram ke had kept Ramoth Gilead, he and all Israel, because of Haziel, the king of Syria. So all these, this is a customary response for this sort of thing. But uh, well, let's go on to verse 15. But King Joram was returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him when he fought with Hazael, the king of Syria. Remember, we picked that up a few years ago. And Jehu said, If it be your minds, then let none go forth nor escape out of the city to go and tell it in Jezreel. So Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel, for Joram lay there. And Ahaziah, the king of Judah, was come down to see Joram. So we got this king from the south visiting. And there stood a watchman in the tower in Jezreel. And he spied the company of Jehu as he came. And he said, I see a company. In other words, he saw a cloud of dust is what he probably saw. And Joram said, take a horseman and send to meet them. 
And let them say, is it peace? So they assume that this, they're bringing some kind of war news here. So they want to check it out. So they went one on horseback to meet him and said, thus saith the king, is it peace? Now Jehu doesn't want to tip his hand yet. See, they don't know what's going on here. All that you've read in the last few verses is private among his loyalists. Thus saith the king, is it peace? And Jehu said, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. He's saying it sort of the way we'd say, Don't sweat it. It's not important. I mean, you know, don't, he's, trying to, he's, he's trying to dismiss it. And the watchman told, saying, The messenger came to them, but he cometh not again. In other words, this messenger then doesn't return. So they sent out a second one, second messenger out on horseback, which came to them and said, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? And Jehu answered, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, He came even unto them, and cometh not again. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi. He drive. So they recognize, as they're getting closer, that his style of handling the chariot was, it's obviously Jehu. No one rides like that, you know. So, <laughs> you've known people like that, right? Anyway, the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he driveth furiously. Let's see, I think I had some interesting insights about the name Furious. Yes, Furiously. Shigayon. The word actually is madness, madness, madman. It's the same word that he used the prophet earlier. Uh, he's very, very furious. He's, he's driving like a crazy man. And, uh, and uh, anyway, okay, let's move on to verse 21. And Joram said, make ready. And his chariot was made ready. And Joram, the king of Israel, and Ahaziah, the king of Judah, went out, each in his chariot, and they went out against Jehu and met him in the portion of Naboth the Jezreelite. Now the plot's getting more interesting here. Jehor Jehoram is the guy that Jehu is really after, but he's got a visitor from this other kingdom. Ahaziah, the other king, is visiting. It could be a big mistake. But in any case, um, where do they happen to coincide? A place called a vineyard of Naboth. Does that ring a bell? Do you see? Do you see? Do you see God's fingerprints behind this? Okay. It came to pass when Joram saw Jehu, he said, "Is it peace, Jehu?" <laughs> and he answered, "What peace, so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many?" Uh oh, <laughs> whoops! <laughs> so Jehu drops any pretense here, and suddenly makes it quite clear that he is showing up as an adversary. Because he's insulting, obviously, um, <laughs> Jehoram's mother and father, etc. So, um, see, uh, he hadn't—he had not expected any, rebe uh, 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 any rebellion. And it's fascinating that they, they, they meet on the very plot of ground that Perizzi brought to to, to, uh, to Nabal. Of course, there was no inkling of Jehu's plans, and so he's showing up as an adversary. It's interesting that is it was Jezebel's idolatry and witchcraft that ruined Israel's peace with God, for which Jehu was settling himself against her son. So he says, you know, is it peace? So he's answering that question in much broader terms than he anticipated. It's the peace with God that was shred by his mother Jezebel that he's there to avenge. That's basically what's emerging here. Okay, verse 23, And Jerome turned his hands, in other words, he tried to turn his chariot around and fled, and said to Ahaziah, There is treachery, O Ahaziah. No kidding. And Jehu drew a bow with his full strength, and he smote Jehoram between his arms, and the arrow went out at his heart, and he sunk down in his chariot. So he's history. Um, kind of interesting because uh, he apparently was taken by surprise. He didn't have any armor on. At least it doesn't seem to be that way. And, and so Jehu easily shot him uh, with a fatal arrow. And Je Je Jehu is a... It's, Jehu is a Tough guy. Let's move on. Verse 25. And then said Jehu to Bidkar, his captain, take up and cast him in the portion of the field of Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember how that when I and thou rode together after Ahab his father, the Lord laid this burden upon him. Surely I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons. Ah, by the way, here's an insight that we did not get back in 1 Kings. See, Jezebel not only had Naboth slandered and then killed, executed like an inquisition, he killed, she killed all his sons. Doesn't say it there, but it's revealed here. 
saith the Lord, and I will requite thee in this plat, saith the Lord. Now therefore take and cast him into the plat of ground according to the word of the Lord. And when Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw this, now he's, he's a visitor. Hey, guys, I'm from Judah. <laughs> when he saw this, he fled by the way of the garden house, and Jehu followed after him and said, Smite him also in the chariot. And they did so at the going up of Gur, which is by Iblim, and he fled to Megiddo and died there. And his servants carried him in a chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in a sepulcher with his father David. So Ahaziah, the king of Judah, is a casualty in this whole situation. Now, by the way, if you compare uh, 2 Kings 9 and uh, 2 Chronicles 22, they all sound contradictory, but they can be reconciled. They can be harmonized. See, evidently Ahaziah fled from Jezreel south by the way of Beth Hagan. Jay and his men pursued him and wounded him near Iblim. And apparently Ahaziah reached Samaria where he hid for some time, according to 2 Chronicles 22, verse 9. And Jehu's men sought him, found him, brought him to Jehu, probably in Jezreel. Jehu may have wounded them there again. And he escaped and fled to Megiddo, but then finally died. So, so the point is the two, the two accounts sound contradictory. They can be reconciled. And that's just a small point. Just, if you want to get into it, you can. Anyway, verse 28, and his, uh, oh yeah, his, his, his servants carried him in the chariot to Jerusalem, buried him there in a sepulcher with his father in the city of David. Verse 29, and in the eleventh year of Joram, the son of Ahab, began Ahaziah to reign over Judah. So now we have an Ahaziah in, the, in, 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 the, in Judah. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. She painted her face and, and uh, tired her head, her head, teared, I guess, teared her head. Is that the girl? You have to help me out there. And looked out at a window. Here, here she is, her adversary is coming to kill her. So she freshens up. Make sure her lipstick's on, got her makeup all set. She's, so you can, yeah, she's not cool, she's just arrogant. Because she knows what's coming, I think. And as, a, as Jehu entered the, in at the gate, she said, Had Zimri peace who slew his master? Now that's quite a slur. Um, her, she's really being sarcastic here. Uh, she, she's trying to shame Jehu by asking if he came in peace. <laughs> Obviously he had not. Uh, Zimri, uh, of course, uh, if you may recall, back in 1 Kings 16, had rebelled against his master, and he himself died only seven days later by the uh, influence of Omri, the founder of Ahab's dynasty. So she's sort of implying that Jehu's rebellion will also destroy him, just as Zimri's had. But um, uh, anyway, for, uh, uh, for what it's worth. Uh, verse 32, he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. And he said, throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses, and he trod her underfoot. <coughs> now, get, I want you to get, put yourself in jail. He, 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 he's taken his horse. He's trampled her, so she's a mess. She's dead, yeah. And when he was come in, he did eat and drink and said, let's go now and see this cursed woman and bury her, for she's the king's daughter. So after he trampled her with the horses, he went in for a quick meal. Got his appetite up, you know. He said, go see this cursed woman and bury her, for she's a king's daughter. Now, as he says that, he's obviously forgetting uh, the prophecies that um, uh, Elijah had said about Jezebel's fate. There's not going to be anything to bury. Because they go out to bury her, and they found no more of her than a skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Why? Because the dogs had gotten to her. And by the time the grave diggers were there, they, the dogs had torn her corpse apart, carried off everything but the skull, feet, and hands. And then it all comes back because in uh, the next few verses, he says, Wherefore they came again and told him. He said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spake by a servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the carcass of Jezebel shall be as the dung upon the face of the field and the portion of Jezreel, so they shall not say, This is Jezebel. Okay, getting warmed up here? Let's get another chapter here. Let's knock it off. Ahab had 70 sons in Samaria, and I don't understand those as being direct sons. They're heirs, they're descendants. As the, the term really means descendants. So you know, you're, these, these could be sons and grandsons and whatever, they're descendants, okay? And, uh, and Jehu, of course, is planning to execute every relative that could possibly succeed Ahab. And so he's going to write letters to all the, uh, the uh, leaders. He says, now, he says, uh, uh, and Jehu wrote letters and sent to Samaria unto the rulers of Jezreel, to the elders, and to them that brought up Ahab's children, saying, Now as soon as this letter cometh to you, seeing your master's sons are with you, and they are with you, uh, they are with you with chariots, horses, and 
a fenced city and also armor. Look even out the best and meetest of your master's sons and set him on his father's throne and fight for your master's house. So Jehu, in a sense, is throwing down the gauntlet here, okay? And so they have a choice, you see. Okay, what they can do is they can try to pick a champion. This is very popular. I mean, the David and Goliath kind of thing. You pick your champion, I'll pick mine. You got your king, I'll take my king. We'll, we'll, the two kings will fight and decide the, decide the day, if you will. So he's challenging to have a new king to fight with him. And so, uh, but uh, we get to verse 4, they were exceedingly afraid. They didn't think this was too good an idea. They knew about this guy, Jehu. <laughs> They were exceedingly afraid and said, Behold, two kings stood not before him. How shall we stand? She's already killed two kings. So what are we going to do? Get, you know, this is, this, they're, they're nervous, <laughs> which is probably what Jehu was hoping on. And he that was over the house and he that was over the city and the elders also and the bringers up of the children sent to Jehu saying, We are thy servants and will do all that thou shalt bid us. We will not make any, we will not make any king. Do thou that which is good in thine eyes. Okay, so Jehu writes another letter. Then he wrote a letter a second time to them saying, If ye be mine, and if ye will hearken unto my voice, take ye the heads of the men your master's sons, and come to me to Jezreel by tomorrow this time. And now the king's sons, being seventy persons, were with great men of the city, which brought them up. And it came to pass, when the letter came to them, that they took the king's sons and slew seventy persons and put their heads in baskets. And sent him, sent him them to Jezreel. And there came a messenger and told him, saying, They have brought the heads of the king's sons. He said, Lay them in two heaps at the entering in of the gate until the morning. Now there's overnight, they're going to let these two piles of heads sit by the city gate. So everybody will get the message. It came to pass in the morning that he went out and he stood and said to all the people, Ye be righteous, behold, I conspired against my master and slew him. See, the first thing he does, he takes personal responsibility for having killed their king. But now he, he, get, he gets, does some dissembling here. He says, but who slew all these guys? He's pretending, see, he had nothing to do with the 70 descendants that have been killed. <laughs> he goes on, he says, Know now that there shall fall unto the earth nothing of the word of the Lord which the Lord spake concerning the house of Ahab, for the Lord hath done that which he spake by a servant Elijah. So Jehu slew all that remained of the house of Ahab in Israel and all his great men and his kinfolks and his priests until he left him none remaining. And he rose and departed and came to Samaria in the way. And he, Jehu met the brethren of Ahaziah, the king of Judah, and said, Who are ye? And they answered, We are the brethren of Ahaziah. And we go down to salute the children of the king and the children of the queen. So they don't know what's going on these are from the southern kingdom there to acknowledge uh, their, you know, you know, the, the, the uh, family of the northern kingdom. And he, that's Jehu, said, take them alive. And they took them alive and slew them at the pit of the shearing house, even two and forty men. Neither lefty any of them. So this guy is uh, getting ca carried away here. Um, so back in verse 6, he, he gave orders. They effectively executed... Ahab 70 uh, heirs, he's taking care of the southern kingdom too. So he's, he's, he's getting quite a reputation here. Um, you see, Jehu wiped out Ahab's heirs in Samaria and Jezreel, and God approved that. But he also executed all of Ahab's chief men, close friends and priests, and God did not approve that. He got carried away and killed too many innocent people. And these innocent people could have helped be him become a more effective king than he proved to be. He's going to miss the leadership and the structure that he unnecessarily uh, wiped out. So uh, now we, we obviously wiped out 42 people of the southern kingdom who obviously had not heard of the goings on up north and, and were victimized by that. So... But he regarded them, you see, as part of the house of Ahab, so he executed them near a well, leaving no survivor. And not all 42 of these were necessarily blood relatives of Ahab, they may, but they may have been related by marriage. But that difference would not have bothered Jehu at all. <laughs> and uh, Okay, verse 15. And when he was departed thence, he lighted on uh, Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. 
And he saluted him and said to him, Is that heart right, as my heart is with thy heart? And Jehonahab answered and said, It is. If it be, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand, took him up to him into the chariot. So that's a, 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 a gesture of honor. And by the way, this guy is a follower of the Lord, so he's a good guy. And he said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride in his chariot. So this idea of shaking hands, bringing the chariot, means that they're in agreement and, and a mutual commitment and so forth. So when he came to Samaria, that's the capital of the northern kingdom, he slew all that remained unto Ahab in Samaria until he had destroyed him, according to the saying of the Lord, which he spake to Elijah. And Jehu gathered all the people together and said to them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu, Jehu, <laughs> Jehu's going to serve him much. They don't understand where his loyalties are. His loyalties are to the God of Israel. They don't realize he's not a Baal worshiper. Jehu gathered all the people together and said to him, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu will serve him much. Serve him like, like maybe for dinner. Huh? Uh, anyway, now therefore call unto me all the prophets of Baal, all his servants, all his priests, and let none be wanting. For I have a great sacrifice to do to Baal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> whosoever shall be wanting, he shall not live. In other words, if you don't show up, you're, you know, this is an obligatory service we're putting together here. But Jehu did it subtly to the intent that he might destroy the worship of Baal. And uh, so he's, he's, he's really cooking this up. He's requiring everyone to attend all the, it's going to be in the central temple of Baal and, and so forth. And uh, Jehu said, proclaim a solemn assembly for Baal. And they proclaimed it. Jehu sent through all Israel, that is all the northern kingdom, and all the worshippers of Baal came, so there was not a man left that came not. I suppose not. This is, you know, death penalty if you don't show up, in other words. And they came into the house of Baal, and the house of Baal was full from one end to another. And then he, this Jehu, said to him that was over the vestry, bring forth the vestments for all the worshippers of Baal. <laughs> and he brought them forth vestments. And Jehu went, and Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, into the house of Baal and said unto the worshippers of Baal, Search and look that there be here with you none of the servants of the Lord, but the worship, worshippers of Baal only. See, guys, this is going to be an exclusive group. Don't let any of those, you know, Jehovah worshippers in here. This is Baal only. Right, guys? Right. You know. And when they went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings, Jehu appointed fourscore men without and said, If any of the men whom I have brought into your hands escape, he that let them go, his life shall be for the life of him. In other words, you let anyone escape and you, you, you lost yours. So that's an incentive program. You know, Jehu knew how to motivate people. And it came to pass as soon as he had made an end of the offering, a burnt offering, which of course just for show, that Jehu said to the guard and to the captains, go in and slay them. Let none come forth. And they smote them with the edge of the sword and the guard and the captains cast them out and went to the city of the house of Baal. And they brought forth the images out of the house of Baal and burned them. And they break down the image of Baal and break down the house of Baal and made it a draft house unto this day. Thus Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. So he was God's instrument of judgment. And uh, But uh, howbeit from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed not from after them, to wit, the golden calves were in Bethel that were in Dan. So Jehu, with all his zeal, still didn't go far enough. He didn't deal with the golden calves at Bethel and Don. And so that was a big mistake. Big mistake. And he's going to turn out to be uh, the... Uh, the uh... So this, this massacre by Jehu really finishes what Elijah had begun at Mount Carmel, if you may recall. But Jehu still didn't completely obey the Lord. And the, the, the text seems to emphasize that. The Lord said unto Jehu, listen to this. Because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in, the, in mine eyes, and hast done unto the house of Ahab according to all that was in mine heart, thy children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. That's good news. In other words, Jehu is going to start a dynasty that will go four generations. That's not bad. But, ooh, there's a... The word but in a performance review is a very disturbing word. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the God of Israel with all his heart. God wants people, wants us, you and I. He wants all of our heart. He doesn't want to be number one on a list of ten. He wants to be number one on a list of one. 
Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God with all his heart, for he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. So more trouble comes. In those days, the Lord began to cut Israel short. And Hazael, that's the Syrian, if you recall, smote them in all the coasts of Israel, from Jordan eastward, all the land of Gilead, and the Gadites, the Reubenites, and the Manassites, from Aror to which is by the river Arnon, even Gilead and Bashan. Now the rest of the acts of Jehu and all that he did, all his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? And uh, so you know, it's, it's, it's really tragic that Jehu's rule was, was characterized by turmoil and unrest. He was not a strong ruler. He's a strong leader in a military sense, but he was not a strong ruler. All kinds of social and economic uh, abuses marked his administration. And that's why all these foreign groups are succeeding against them. And uh, so, uh, and when Hezael attacks, you see Assyria had forced Jehu to bow before him and pay tribute. And by the way, there's a bas relief in Shalmaneser's uh, so called black obelisk, archaeologically speaking, shows uh, Jehu doing this. It's the only picture we have of an Israelite king that's been found so far, by the way. But uh, Jehu slept with his fathers and they buried him in Samaria. And Jehu has his son reigned in his stead. And the time that Jehu reigned over Israel in Samaria was 28 years. And uh, one of the things that weakened his rule was that he didn't have the advantage of these seasoned officials, which he slew unnecessarily. Uh, back there, in uh, verse 11, chapter 10. And uh, his ruthlessness also made all kinds of people, even his allies, suspicious of him. And the, the alliance that they had between Judah and Israel is also torn, of course, because when Jehu killed Judah's king, Ahaziah. And Israel's treaty with Phoenicia is also ended when he killed Jeroboam, Jezebel, and the prophets of Baal. So God is starting to reduce the size of Israel uh, during Jehu's reign. And he reigned, uh, in all, he reigned about 28 years, obviously. 